So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session from the Trustee Learning Programme. Today we're talking about inclusion on trustee boards. But before I pass over to Francis Brown, who's chairing the panel this afternoon, a few bits of housekeeping. So as you will have seen, the session is being recorded. The recordings do go onto YouTube. That recording doesn't include the chat. But everybody who's registered for this session will also be sent a Zoom link to the recording, and that recording does include the chat. So please bear that in mind for any questions or comments that you're making in the chat. You've been muted as you've arrived. Please stay muted unless Francis comes to you for a question. That just helps keep the sound nice and clear for everybody. Closed captions have been enabled at our end, so if you'd like the subtitles, you need to click the CC or closed caption button on your device. Um, we've got here session content is specific to England and Wales. Of course, with a topic like this, it's pretty much relevant wherever you are in the world, um, not just England and Wales. Please absolutely feel free to use the chat to share experiences, to make comments, to ask questions. Francis will be looking for questions in the chat. And then a huge thank you to our sponsors, Russell Cook. It's thanks to them that this session and others like it are completely free of charge to attend. And thank you also today to the City Bridge Foundation who funded this session in particular. All of our panellists are from organisations in London. The session is about uh, inclusion on London trustee boards. But of course, again, many of the principles are applicable wherever you are. So thank you for coming. On that note, I'm going to pass over to Francis. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us for this conversation. I'm going to try to take up as little space as I can because I'm sure we're going to have a very rich conversation. I don't want to take up space. So we know, obviously, we're here to talk about inclusion on boards. In particular, we're talking about London boards. But as Penny has said, it's a universal theme. So we have a, a wonderful panel who've joined us today to talk about their experiences. And I'm just going to kick off by asking each of you to introduce yourself. And I'm going to go in the order that you appear on my screen. So Rashmi, can I ask you to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Rashmi Rungta and uh, I've been on boards of not-for-profits for about seven years now. Uh, I have four active. Um, I used to be on, a, on the board of a state school in Camden and other other boards as well right now i've joined uh, the board of association of chairs which provides a peer learning network for uh, the chairs of not for profits thank you rashmi and can i go next to you jason uh thanks francis yeah thank you for inviting me to kind of come along and share some thoughts so my name's jason I've probably was trying to work out. I've probably been a trustee for over ten years now, probably about eleven, twelve years. Um, uh, some charities, some kind of uh, social enterprises, um, and more recently involved in a lot of healthcare academic initiatives as as well. So, um, yeah, nice, it's nice to be here. Nice to attend. Thank you, Jason. Um, Bola, can I ask you to introduce yourself, please? course um so i'm bola um i actually started my trustee journey um through beyond suffrage so it was a program just helping to get um young young women of color onto trustee boards so from then um i've just sat on two different um boards kind of like dipping in and out of the kind of trustee world um but also help out with the young trustee movement quite a lot as well so i like, always kind of keeping in touch in that way too fabulous thank you bola and last but not least, Lucy. Thank you. Sorry, I am having an issue, so I may switch off my camera in a bit. Um, my name is Lucy. I am a trustee and a chair of a charity board in in Havering. It's a volunteer. 2022 um, and I'm okay we're not hearing you wonderfully well so you might have to turn off your camera just for the benefit of people here unfortunately Lucy's experienced a bit of a lag in um, in timing so maybe if the camera's off it would be a little bit faster a little bit more responsive 
Okay, so I'm going to kick off with the first question, which has now disappeared. Okay, so what I'd like to ask each of you is just to tell us briefly what motivated you to join the board of a charity, and particularly as somebody from a, 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 an underrepresented community on charity boards. So I'm going to start off with you, Jason. Uh, thanks, Francis. Um, I, yeah, I mean, initially, and I probably will share a brief story. So I, I didn't really know what a trustee was or what a board was for charity, if I'm honest, when I first started out. And I was actually at an event. Um, I'm not going to name the charity, but I was at this event anyway. And I got speaking to somebody who said that they run an organisation in South London. So that's where I'm originally from. I don't live in South London anymore. And I was surprised to hear that they ran such an organisation in South London because I've never heard of them. And they said that this organisation has been going for 20 years. And I was really astounded because I was like, well, if you're doing all this good work for 20 plus years, how come I don't know about this organisation? Mm. And, they, and they challenged me. They said, OK, well, why don't you come along and see what we're doing? So I went along and actually they said, oh, we're looking for people to you know join our board. And I didn't really know what I was signing up to, if I'm honest. Um, I had, and, and then when I, when I went there... I was with people who were completely outside of my frame of reference at the time. So remember, we're talking about 12 years ago now, but um, so people that were bankers, lawyers, senior government officials. And, and I was in a world where I was like, wow, so all these people kind of give up their time to try and steer this organisation. But yet they don't have, at the time, what I felt, real people like me coming from those areas, you know, the people that are being impacted by the programmes that they're trying to deliver. Um, mm. They never had anyone like that around the table. So for me, it was a real eye-opening experience. Um, one that I didn't really, it wasn't a positive experience, I would say, but I really valued the exposure. So it kind of demystified what a board looks like. It also helped me to understand um, the different professional um, professionals that get involved in charity boards. Um and yeah, I was, I was really appreciative of, of the kind of the challenging learning experience that I had during that time. And I think I was there for about three years um, before I stepped down. So, yeah. OK, we'll explore a bit about your experiences in a moment. Um, Bola, can I ask you to tell us a bit about, you know, what motivated you and what were your expectations? Yeah, it was an interesting one because um, this was kind of I was kind of in between a career change um, and I'd worked quite heavily with like especially at university with a lot of like different organizations charities things like that um and my job at the time was um working with a company called Stemet so that was again like non-for-profit um and I was making the, the switch into tech which I knew was you know corporate greed galore so I kind of wanted something that I felt like oh I can still kind of give back in in a way yeah. so when the program came about I was like okay this is absolutely perfect um yeah I think I had zero expectations to be honest of what a board would be like or anything like that and yeah I would definitely very highly recommend the program because they kind of took us through like all the key elements of what it is to be on a board again demystified all the like especially when it comes to like the finances and stuff and like looking at you know the board packs and all this information and it can seem really really heavy um but kind of broke it down um and I think one thing that motivated me to like keep on course because even after the program I think I was still kind of apprehensive of what it would look like for me to actually join a board um but precious the ceo she kept saying like don't forget like you feel like you can't contribute to some charities because you don't have that lived experience but think about the people who are actually on the board and think about the experience even just from like you growing up and everything in in, in like london and south london all that stuff just from that can contribute so much more than you even realize. So that's kind of been what's motivated me to like make sure I kind of stay in, in, in the circle and like maintain that. Even if I can't like fully be on a board, just being associated and like encouraging other people because I understand like how important it is to have those diverse voices. Fabulous. Lucy, you want to tell us a bit about what's motivated you and your first expectations? Yes, sure. Um, can you hear me better now? Absolutely. Very clear. Okay, great. Um, so I was motivated as I spent quite a lot of time working um, within charities on the frontline kind of side. And I also saw, um, I suppose, the difficulties of kind of running a charity and in terms of the governance. And I especially wanted more 
uh, experience of this and um, kind of to understand more where maybe I could be putting my experiences and expertise in that kind of way. Um, and especially in terms of, I came across a lot of comments of, you know, being a trustee is for a much older person who's retired. Why do you want to do that? Um, and I really felt that's not true and that charity should be kind of representative of who they are, um, you know, who uses their services. And so that's another reason I really wanted to get into being a trustee um, as a younger person and then also advocating for younger people on boards. Great, um, fabulous. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Rashmi, what about you? What motivated you when you first joined a board? Yeah, my, my, my first board was a London charity and um, I honestly did not know what to expect. Um, the the opportunity just came across and I, I did have an aspiration that I wanted to, um, you know, be uh, like be a, a board member. Uh, and I thought that would be a good step. Um, also, um, I was interested in the charity because um, they were providing recruitment in the third sector f uh, with the young graduates. So I just thought it's a win-win situation for everyone. And they were providing training on the job as well. So uh, having kind of been an interested, you know, being being in like uh, upliftment of uh, young people, I, I joined the board and it, it's it's been an interesting journey so far and uh, as I said I mean uh, right now I mean I'm on I'm four different boards I mean sometimes I ask myself people ask me do you how do you take out the time but I think it's just if you enjoy it you you do it and yeah. and there are different challenges you go through as well but you know challenges are everywhere <laughs> Absolutely. It's interesting to hear about the, the the different motivations and, you know, particularly what you're saying, Jason, about seeing these board, seeing boards who are providing programs and services for, for individuals who are just not represented, not seen on the board. And then the other themes that I'm hearing, which is about people feeling, well, you know, are these spaces for me or actually what are these mystery spaces and what do they do? Um, and not necessarily thinking that you can be part of that until some opportunities kind of opened up in up, opened up in front of you. So we'll we'll let, we'll hopefully explore that a bit more as we go through our conversations. So let's start off on a positive note. So let's share some positive experiences that you've had as a as a trustee because it'd be interesting to know you know where you might have felt you know valued and respected and what you think helped to make that happen. So, Rashmi, can I start with you? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the school uh, experience that I had. It, it, um, um, I did one term and then I left. Um, it, it was a state school in Camden, a primary school with actually excellent Ofsted rating. And it had, it, I mean, uh, surprisingly, the board, not actually surprisingly, but the board was quite diverse. Um, I mean, obviously, when, when you join uh, the board of a school, uh, mm. there are co-opted members and then there are uh, non-co-opted who are parent governors. Uh, so I, I think I was the only uh, person of color in the co-opted uh, governor. But yeah, I think I think everyone was quite uh, welcoming, and uh, they didn't make me feel as if yeah I was I was you know someone kind of uh, out of place. Um, so I think that that really helped me uh, you know uh, get um, uh, you know you know work with the board, and and that that's something that's very important. That I mean uh, you know. People, people trust and respect each other and respect each other's comments and um, have those listening skills as well, you know. Fabulous. Jason, can you tell us about, you know, positive experience that you've had yeah, and, what sure. helped, and what helped to make that experience positive for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so what, what, the re more recent kind of board experience I have on the, on the current charity that I'm involved in Um so this one was quite interesting. So initially, I was told about the opportunity that they would need new some new board members, but I had to go through a more formal process than the first one actually. So I had to, you know, fill in a proper application, um, have an interview with a panel, um, and then I got received the kind of, um, you know, acceptance to join. But I think what was really what was really quite nice with this board is that all because um, it's quite a small charity. There's only a small staff team. Um, 
all of the board members play a, an active, more active role. So it's more kind of an operational board membership. Um, and so one of the things that I was tasked with was developing this kind of lived experience leadership program. So that's that's basically my background is all about lived experience, um, primarily mental health, but more in kind of trying to improve social justice, really. So, yes, yeah, so I was tasked with chairing um, the lived experience development program. Um, so given that responsibility, you know, I think the, the beauty was um, we went through the first cohort of this program and I was giving out um, certificates in a hotel um, around the corner from Trafalgar Square. Beautiful evening of, you know, seeing the participants graduate from the program. And, and for me, that just fills me with so much joy, right? So um, outside of kind of like the day-to-day -day work and, and struggles of life and family and all of that stuff, to be able to kind of, give time to other people and see them succeed really mm. motivates me so um so yeah I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the current experience that I'm on fabulous it's good to hear Lucy what about you what's made you feel valued and respected as a as a board yeah. member thank you um I would say it also at uh, the only have experience in one charity but also starting from the point of um recruitment for trustees so the fact that it was for online through reach volunteering but there and then they were kind of saying about the inclusion of people from you know diverse backgrounds younger people and then going on to the board um again the inclusion and the encouragement from all of the board and the fact that i do have things to share it is worthwhile i can add value and also again the encouragement from the um staff team as well all the employees um encouraging me in that way in terms of everything that I could share, all the ways I could be developing myself um, and how, like the value add that I can have to the board. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And and over to you, Bella, what's what's helped you? I definitely think it is the people. Um, when I think about like great experiences I've had, um, I think my last um, stint was like a transitional um, board. So it wasn't like their full board, it was kind of just helping set up for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really great because I think there was one like the trust in me because I've only I feel like I'm a baby trustee but the trust in like that I have the responsibility to do that and um, I think the CEO she was really really supportive of like checking in so like she would call me after a couple of um, meetings we had to just check in on me and say like is everything okay like do you need any support and then the chair as well like if there's any times that there's like high pressure um because again it was quite operational so we're doing like a lot of the core work and doing that and then your job can be stressful so I think it was the fact that like someone's like reaching out to checking on you and make sure that you're okay and you can cope and like if if it's too much it's fine and like people say that I don't mean it but they genuinely meant it where like genuinely yeah. if you need any support um I think that was really good because it kind of made me feel less like I have to come and be perfect and like do everything perfect it was like no we're all learning together like this is something we're setting up so if there's any help you need um and then very good at like kind of getting external people as well which is sometimes things you can forget is like oh no there you don't always have to find information within your board or within even the actual charity there can be external people who can come in so I think people being able to like spot where those connections can be made um is very very helpful so yeah I'd say definitely the people fabulous so obviously we're talking about people who are in London boards and we know that London is known for its vibrant multiculturalism so how can charities leverage that multiculturalism to foster innovation, creativity, um, and cultural competency within their decision-making process and how they govern. And let's start with you, Jason. I feel like I'm picking on people. No, no, no you always give me the hard <laughs> questions. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so the first question, I mean, the first kind of caveat, I would say it depends on what obviously the charity, the aims of the charity are on. And so whether, yeah. whether or not the charity is tasked with trying to improve things for kind of a diverse population or whether it's targeting a kind of specific population. I think for me, though, um, so more fundamentally, I, you know, because I grew up in South London, I remember seeing difference all around me and, and yeah. throughout my kind of working life and my kind of trajectory, I think I've more much more appreciated the kind of projects and the teams that I've been involved with where there are different people around me. And I think what that helps for me, um, at least, is it helps me to learn 
from others' experience. And it also helps me to kind of have the voice and have the confidence to actually share my own experience. I think the spaces that I've been in where everyone has a very narrow kind of comfortable kind of frame of reference, I feel more out of place in those sorts of environments just because it feels um just feels like there's no room to breathe almost. Um so yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, so it really does depend on kind of what the charity is trying to achieve, really. Uh, I think there is much value in tapping into, especially people who have international connections, I would say. Um, yeah. So some of, I, I was very fortunate to go join a board in America and we could, I could only really do this because we were on, in Zoom, so during the pandemic and, yeah. you know, so we could do meetings in America from from my, from my bedroom. And, and, and actually that experience of working with those American colleagues was phenomenal. Just the way they think, the way they approach things, the way they raise money money um really exposed me to uh yeah a world which makes me understand that if we're not utilizing you know what london is good for you know diversity creativity you know building connections um and we're always kind of trying to write grants to the same funders that everyone else is applying for we're missing the kind of innovation that could potentially happen if we just brought in new people into the board really so those are my um reflections fabulous and bola what about you how do you think that charities can, you know, leverage diversity to to improve their 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 structures and their and the decision making? Yeah, I think um, I was part of a judging panel last year um, for like the governance awards, and I think the one um, there are actually two people, but I think for this was a good example. Um, the one charity that I always think of because they kind of went really above and beyond um, was women in prison, so they mm. kind of realize that their board didn't match the the population of women that actually be in prison um so they actually partnered with beyond suffrage um not that i'm just you know plugging them but it, like it was a good work um so they partnered with them and they actually ran a program looking to get so they like recruited um black women specifically because they're like overrepresented in prisons and they trained them up and then put them on the boards and then they kind of just didn't leave it there but they you know had buddy systems they checked in, all those kind of things. So I think 100% um, with, with Jason in terms of like actually knowing who the demographic is that you are meant to be targeting and then finding people within your circle who already probably talk to those people and you can make that partnership and, and gain people on your board like that. Um, I feel like makes such a big difference because like there are so many things that you don't even you might not even be able to consider um you might be able to empathize and say okay yeah i understand what it is to be to to go to a prison can talk to someone but the actual lived experience of like being up in prison and coming back and that whole rehabilitation having that on the board is is so much more different than anything else um and yeah and they saw like how it improved kind of like just bottom up like daily um yeah daily operations and and everything was like so much more beneficial. So I think they're carrying on with the program, but yeah, I always just think of that as like a, a perfect example of that. Yeah, that sounds that great. I'm just looking at something in the chat and somebody said, what is this event about? So just in case it's been missed, I didn't bother to say it is my fault. I didn't say what we were, what we were here for. I just assumed everybody who joined knew, but this session- Hi, sorry. Hi, sorry. I, I didn't mean what is it about. I was like, what's the objective of the event? That was what I was asking him. So we're having this an hour of our time, but what, what are we aiming to achieve out from here? And that's that's what I was trying to get. Okay. So the aim is for people, to, I suppose, to learn from other people's experiences. So the panel here are just sharing their experience of being a trustee of a London-based charity where they are from an underrepresented community and what that means for them and what their experiences are. So hopefully at the end of this, we'll have a bit of a greater insight into what that experience is like, the, the, the bad bits and the good bits. And then obviously we're gonna take questions from the, from the attendees. So hopefully we'll be able to answer some of the burning issues that they have on their mind. Does that help? Yeah, slightly different from what I expected, but um, uh, yeah. I, I I had a different sort of concept in mind about what it was about. That's okay, though. Okay. All right, then. We'll, we'll plow on, and hopefully something that you were looking for comes out of the conversation. So, Rashmi, over to you. I'm going to go with a different question. 
Can you tell us a bit about how you believe lack of diversity on charity balls might impact decision making and the culture of the organization? Yeah, and I think I, I will bring it back to uh, some of the answers we had from, from the previous question from uh, Bola and uh, Jason is that I think, it you know, the, the, the board should be representative of the kind of demographic they are serving um, because, um, you know, uh, pe people are bringing in lived experience you know, with them. And, uh, you know, for example, when Jason joined his first board, I mean, he didn't know the charity existed. And, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of uh, demographic they were serving, they didn't have any any representative for for that on the board. So I, I think it's it's very important. I mean, for example, I, I am born and grew up in India. It's, it's a com completely different... Um, um, experience from from the UK, although I have I have traveled globally. But so I mean, I'm, I'm kind of bringing in that global experience onto the board. And uh, uh, like, I've, I've been on six boards now so far. Uh, and and a lot of boards I've seen, I'm, I'm the only person of color on, on the board. And, um, so, you know, I mean, some in some boards, it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been a challenge. Some some boards not. They've been quite accepting. Um, so I think it's very important to have that diversity in thinking, you know, from the different members of the board, because yeah. the board is a critical friend to the organization. They are making sure the organization is, um, you know, ha having that governance, right governance in place, you know, be it risk, be it strategy, be it you know, corporate. So it's very important to bring that diversity of thinking onto the board. Fabulous. I, I mean, yeah, fantastic point. Is there anything that anybody wants to add to add to those points that Rashmi's just made from your own perspectives? I'm not going to pick on you. You're going to just now have a conversation. I would um I would add and I would agree. And I think for me, especially as a younger person coming on, I don't think any of the trustees on the board are actually Actually working and so even just that kind of thing of still you know you're there are still employees in your charity and like having the representation and someone that they can relate to in the fact that they are working you know so there's all the, whole, all the things about in terms of um is it inclusive in terms of your board I mean for me it's quite a long way to travel I still have to work those kind of things as well as then actually you know what you're bringing especially in terms of you're helping around people or HR issues you know that that world moves very fast and so if you're having you have a board of trustees who are not actually in that kind of working world there may be things that they just don't experience anymore mm -hmm. um but then again i would just add as everyone else has said you know the world's constantly changing london's constantly changing and you need to kind of be representative of you know not only those in charity that your charity helps but also the people within the organization who are employed there as well absolutely Anybody else want to chip in on that particular question? I'll repeat it if you want. So how do we think that the lack of diversity basically impacts decision-making and the culture of the organisation? Are you going to make me pick on you? <laughs> um, I, I, I was trying to think of something sensible to say. I think for me... Um, I think it's around the idea generation. So um, a lot of the times, I mean, in the trusteeships that I've been involved in, the key issue is raising funds. So whether that is um, writing grants, getting sponsorships, speaking to kind of uh, philanthropists and, and all of that stuff. And I think what happens is if, if you have people that have the same, you know, outlook on life, upbringing, same access to the same information, you're basically, and a lot of the times the charities that are involved, they spend a lot of time trying to write the grants to the same funders. And there's yeah. only about 10 funders that fund the line of work that they're interested in. Um, and I think if you have like diverse you know, people, different experiences, different ways of raising money, you're able to kind of find other ways to sustain the charity. So you're not just reliant on those major grants. You know, you can actually diversify. You can think about how can you bring in different revenue streams. And, and I know it may sound like... Um, because obviously charity is not a business, but I think the charities that I've been in that work really well have multiple income streams and are not just reliant on the main grant right. funders for the sector. Um, so I think that's where lack of diversity is is, is critical. Really. Yeah, it's a, it's an important point because there, there there's so much evidence in terms of research to show that diverse boards 
have more diverse thinking and therefore make better decisions. And for those who are commercial organizations, make more money. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention the fact that if you want to be, um, if you want to be legitimate to the communities that you serve, that's going to be better served if the board reflects that community and brings some of those experiences and perspectives. So that's not one that we can underestimate at all. So I'm going to go to a, a question from the chat. So Angela, are you there? Do you want to ask this question yourself? I'm happy to ask on your behalf. Hello. Hi, Angela. <laughs> um, so I'm a new trustee. Um, the charity that I'm a trustee for is a charity for older people. Um, so I'm a carer, full-time carer for my parents. Um, but I have recently been brought on board, um, I think, <laughs> Um, during my interview process they couldn't see me um, so anyway when I turned up for my first board meeting I think they were all quite shocked um, very welcoming but I think it was a shock for them anyway um, not much time in um, board meetings time is not carved out currently to get to know each other um, I'm also at least 20 years our chair is 84 bless him um, how any tips from the panel on how I can build rapport with with fellow trustees to make things work smoother <laughs> okay does anybody want to volunteer to go first on this any tips that you might have about how do you build rapport with your fellow board members can I come in yes of course yeah. So what, what I would recommend, Angela, is first of all, I know a lot of boards don't do well in providing an induction, uh, you know, when you join the board, because I think that's very important. And I uh, I mean, we have been talking about this on, on a lot of boards about having an induction and having like a, a mentor. Uh, um, on the board as well but I think uh, in the absence of that what you can do is and what I have done uh, in, in the six boards that I've been on I've uh, tried having one-to-one -one conversations with the other board members maybe just said let's meet for a coffee especially if you're living in the same area and another thing would be is um, go go to the chair and have a have a word with him just just tell him that uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm feeling a bit lost. So can you please help me out? And they will they will take it well. Uh, you know, uh, they they won't beat you up on it. Uh, that's that's the best way of doing it. Be be honest and be upfront and and you know share your feedback, basically. Fabulous advice, Rashmi. Is anything anyone wants to add to any of that? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I, I would agree um, with what Rashmi is saying. Um, I think one of the so the American experience that I spoke about earlier, one because obviously I wasn't in America, one of the ways that I kind of built that in was just to kind of yeah ask for like half an hour or, or maybe twenty minutes, just do an online meeting, and not to talk about business, just to talk about who we are as people, um, and that really helped actually. And there's one person who's now moved to Switzerland and is inviting me over there, so, so it does it does work actually, but it, it does take time and effort. And I think it's for me it's around. Um, getting past that fear of rejection, I guess, yeah. you know? Um, so that was the kind of biggest hurdle for me, really. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes in order to to build rapport, we have to be a little bit vulnerable. We have to we have to kind of share things about ourselves that, that you know, where we don't feel confident. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be, that can be quite challenging. I don't think I can remember an instance where somebody has put themselves in that position where they haven't been received well, it's the fear rather than the reality that's often the, the the challenge that we have. Anybody else want to add to add to those fabulous points? Okay, I'm going to build on that. Can I can I just sorry uh, uh, inject in there, uh, and you might be building on it later on as well. But I think it's important that uh, from the question Angela has asked, I think it's easier said, yes, we have this catch ups and all that, but sending mind check, mindset changes are not so easy as well. With certain boards, it's just going to be there. And I, I do think it would be a little bit of a time to sometimes break the ice. Um, it's it's not going to be as simple as yeah okay one meeting and yeah I'll, okay the chair is not 84 it's not going he's not going to change he or she it's hard right it's they're stuck sometimes in how they've been molded to and for their tenure but I think it's also 
not shying away from being vocal about, uh, you know, if you've got ideas to share and all of that, I think it's important because that's what you're there on the board for. You are there to, you know, brought you in for a certain reason. You pass the interview and yes, you. So I do think that it's 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 not just, oh yeah, let's, let's all be buddies and friends because your role is on governing the organization. So I do think that playing on your skills Bringing your ideas forward is more important than gaining that sort of like respect around what you're there for. Thank you, Sonia, for that contribution. Right, so building on some of that, the next thing I wanted to ask the panel is how can the charities um, create a more inclusive environment, particularly for underrepresented trustees so that they are able to thrive and to contribute meaningfully? Bola, can we start with you? Perfect, if I could just unmute myself. Um, but yeah, so there are a couple of things that I think have worked quite well in the past. Um, so I think definitely having like a very open recruitment process, you just, you you open up the amount of people, type of people that can apply. So um, I know some charities in the past, they've kind of done, you know, you can type it in or you can literally do like a kind of a video and just film yourself, or you can just do a voice note or something like that and answer the questions. And, and that helps with, again, getting diversity, especially where we kind of look at like um, neurodiversity and things like that, like you're just opening yourself up to so many more people. And I think, at least maybe personally for me, when I do see like an ad, a job ad that is quite open and that I know that they've actually considered it, it makes me think, okay, this isn't like old and stale. Like mm. someone thinking about these things, like this is a place that I can definitely implement stuff um, and people listen to me because they're already kind of doing it. Um, so I think it definitely starts like from the beginning. Um, and then I think the biggest thing that I've seen where like people kind of let themselves down is like, once they're on the board, it's like, okay, that's fine. We just kind of move on. Um, but I think there does definitely does need to be those check-ins. Um, a buddy system, I think, is a great way of like kind of alleviating quite a lot of that because like you've assigned someone to someone else who maybe has a bit more knowledge. Um, so there was even um at my last board the talk of doing that and having like maybe not necessarily like full on trustees, but people who are like kind of they can shadow trustees so they can come in to um, our board meetings, they can see the board pack, but maybe they don't necessarily make a decision, but at least they've got that experience and it makes them feel like it's less daunting. And again, like if someone is like, okay, I'm done and my time's over, then they can easily apply for that position and know that like they feel supported um, and trusted to do that role. So I think it is kind of just sometimes thinking a bit outside of the box of like, how do we show that we care and then actually implement that we care as well? Um, it's not enough. I think a lot of people just do like, we'll partner with, with these charities and like, you know, they can pass me someone over and, uh, and like, I could just get someone on the board, but like definitely thinking of like, what do like, what kind of knowledge that this, does that person have? How do we encourage them to show that knowledge? And then how do we kind of build on top of it to make sure that they, feel okay to contribute because they probably already have something great to contribute it's just kind of the vessel in doing it yeah and you and you make an interesting point because it starts from the advert the advert tells you something about yeah. the organization um it's kind of how it sets its stall and i know we're getting on board talk about this a lot in the training they do about you know how do you diversify your board and how do you recruit um it's it's a it's a shop window and a little bit of a reflection about the culture that might lie behind it. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to add is it's about the formal and informal way. So budgeting is a quite formalized way that you might make sure that they have a link. Um, but I don't I think we underestimate, you know, making forging relationships, having that informal time that um, that you were talking about, Jason, having that informal time just to get to know each other as people behind the conversation is 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 really important and it can affect how you have a conversation it can affect how you take um a contribution how you hear it because you filter it through a different kind of lens once you have a better understanding of that person and where they're coming from lucy do you have any thoughts on on this question about how you might include uh, make a more inclusive environment for for new trustees and underrepresented trustees coming onto a board yeah, definitely. I have quite a few. And I also wanted to pick up um, in the chat, Femi has said that away days are brilliant. 
and I wanted yeah. to, I was going to say that they are and at the trust at the charity I'm at we have an away day every every year and it also includes the employees as well so that there's time for them to bond with that actual track on the board um, and again we're constantly looking and reviewing about who's on the board the skills on the board what's kind of lacking on the board also you know the way in which the charity is changing what we're kind of needing in terms of the skills as well and then just touching again on the, um, the advertising you know I can't remember what the percentage is but it's so much that um, a lot, so many trustee roles are just given through word of mouth and you know it is so important that you do advertise them you are putting them on places you know like trustees unlimited getting on board reach volunteering you know young trustees like on boards like there's so many important and and not just doing word of mouth um mm-hmm. and then yeah that and then and then again you know thinking actually just because you're in that position it doesn't mean that you just stay in stay stagnant you know constantly changing there's so many great resources out there for people to be able to kind of brush up on the knowledge of different things um to continue doing that as well in terms of learning and and um as Bola was saying you know sorry my mind's gone the shadow board programs are really good and actually the young trustee movement have like a model board boardroom series and so you can the idea is you can go in and you could kind of test these scenarios that you may kind of find in the boardroom um so it's like in a a safe environment you you'd have somewhere that you can kind of come across them um, Mm -hmm. in that way yeah great great ideas i mean definitely having people able to come onto the board as observers is is a great is a great way and i think i was talking to somebody about it today and he was talking about you know how do you nurture talent and grow confidence to become on boards and and a lot of trust a lot of charities including one that i'm supporting at the moment are bringing people through their committees so it's less of a time commitment it doesn't hold all the responsibilities but you get that taste of working with each other collectively making decisions having conversations which then nurtures that talent and nurtures that confidence to then become a a trustee in the in the future so on that what kind of support or resources above anything that you've already said do you think would be most helpful for underrepresented trustees to fill their roles uh, effectively and with confidence? I'm going to come to you first, Bola. Well, could you repeat the question again? Sorry. Yeah, sure. What sort of support or resources do you think are most helpful for underrepresented trustees to be able to fulfill their roles effectively and with confidence? Yeah. So I think I think it depends on like the path everyone's come from. So like, for example, it, if it's kind of come from like a lived experience and then you just kind of want to join the trusteeship, I would say kind of that like the basic and I think probably for a lot of people who join trusteeships, there's a lot of like the the basic like governance and all that kind of stuff that doesn't necessarily come straight out of the gate is like as you're on the board that kind of develops. But I think maybe having those kind of like if someone's coming from that lived experience and they don't necessarily know that much about the charity world, but having those kind of sessions where we talk about governance, mm-hmm. um, how do we do funding? How do we do all those kind of stuff? People, again, probably have that idea from lived experience, but just kind of having that baseline understanding to like just kind of solidify like, yeah, one, I definitely 100% I'm on the right track or I've learned something new and then that can help me in contributing. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's just maybe like my, the way my mind works, but I like to feel like, okay, I've I've come with a good, like, you know, 101 on like trusteeship and then I can kind of work on that. Um, so I definitely say like that induction is so important. So having like proper, a proper induction about the charity, but again, about what to be expected from the board. Um, if it is like, like a smaller board and they're more hands-on, what what does that look like um if it's a larger board and it's more of kind of like decision making and like reading those packs okay what does like what what do what do those board packs look like how like literally those kind of nitty gritty i think is really helpful because it just gives everyone puts everyone on the same like level um and then you can kind of build on that um so yeah i think yeah for me i i would have although i kind of already kind of went through it it would be nice to have that again because i think all knowledge is good knowledge. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably like my number one thing. 
Great, thank you very much. And Rashmi, anything you think in terms of support or resources that are helpful? Yeah, I mean, um, again, uh, from my experience, I, I mean, some of my boards have had governance review. Um, I think it's very important to have a governance review every few years because it just helps to identify how the board is working together. And uh, second thing that I've found very useful on one of my boards is board appraisals. Uh, so the board members will go through an appraisal with the chair. Um, you know, they they get a chance to kind of talk about what's working well, what's not working well, how mm -hmm. are they feeling. And I think it's also very important about um, how um, the meetings are chaired. Actually, the role of a chair, whether it's a committee or whether it's a board, is very important because, you know, they, they can also ensure that everyone has a voice uh, and, and you know, everyone is getting a chance to kind of speak at, at the board meeting uh, and getting to voice their opinion. So these these things are very important. I, and I think I've already mentioned earlier, like a board induction, you know, getting to meet, you know, with, with the staff. Um, and in some of my boards, actually, we've also started like... Uh, informal meetings with with the, some of the staff members because you know sometimes what happens is uh, the board is like an exclusive uh, uh, team and the staff don't even know about the board so i think mm -hmm. it's very important that it, it shouldn't be that exclusive club uh, because we are working for the organization right it's it's for the benefit of all stakeholders including the employees so it's very important for 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 that connect to happen as well yeah it's it's very common in organizations that you know there's this mystery group that meets once a quarter and we don't <laughs> really know who they are and we don't know what they do and uh, and as a person who's been head of governance many organizations i've done lots of work to try to meet the trustees these are who they are and mm. you do it for a bit and then nobody's interested mm. they move on but you know, but it's demystifying, isn't it? Demystifying exactly. what it's about <laughs> and making it feel much more accessible. Yeah. Um, another question that came, and I'm gonna ask, I'm directing this to you, Jason, because um somebody said, Can you shed a light on working remotely as a trustee? And I presumably they mean what makes it work? Yes. Um, so, I mean, obviously, before the pandemic, um, you know, I, 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 to be fair, I did do some remote work because I used to do a lot of work in Europe, but um, it was only since the pandemic kicked off. And I think what happened was, um, so there was this advocacy organisation, so a mental health advocacy organisation, and they particularly were doing really well in terms of building their presence. When the pandemic kicked off, they kind of obviously, every, everyone's online. And... Um, one of the challenges they had was that they didn't have enough diversity at the top of their organization. So mm -hmm. they actively, you know, went out and kind of seat people. I kind of applied and joined um, that board. And I think for, for me, it's like, um, there was no real difference between online and offline. I think offline, you have more chance to kind of have those um, like informal chats um, before you sit down with the meeting. Um, so online is pretty much the same. You receive all of the papers, um, you have obviously some decisions to make. Um, I think one of the challenges though, to kind of pick on um, some of the challenges is, was that we were tasked with um, recruiting a new CEO for the organization. And um, what was challenging about it is that not, that, so we managed to t complete the task, but what happened was they only stayed in the organization for about a year and then they kind of rolled off into another organization. And what that meant was for us, because we were a small organization, they kind of went off with a six figure salary for a year and didn't really do anything for the organization as, as far as I was concerned. Um, but what that got me thinking is about how, so we can make these decisions, but actually how are we holding people to account if we're not physically in the same space as people, I guess, because you can only get a, a video box of what people look like and how they're behaving. Um, so are we really getting to the nuts and bolts of it? Um, and the other, the other, to kind of sideline a little, the only thing I would say about support was for one of the healthcare organisations I'm involved in, we actually have um, a pre-board meeting and a post-board meeting. And what that's about, really, because there's three public members, so we're kind of members of the public on this board, and it's, it's, it's filled with basically directors of large-scale healthcare organisations. And what we do as public members, because we are the ones that are not working directly for these healthcare organisations, yeah, we do this pre-meet so we can decide what it is that we're trying to raise at the meeting. And then mm -hmm. we do a post-meet 
to kind of really solidify kind of what you know how do we all feel about the meeting were there any areas that we need to reach out on and i find that really helpful um yeah just in terms of my own kind of um, learning and development really so fabulous that's really helpful thank you yeah i mean re remote working is is now a factor of life isn't it and uh, a lot of balls have not gone back to doing all of their meetings together some for example they have their board meetings where they meet in person and their committee meetings are still online because they find that works effectively but they need to make they want that opportunity to have contact and to have space uh, and the only thing i'd also add to it is that because people are meeting face to face doesn't mean they're always making space for informal conversation and informal ways of, of being together. Um, yeah, I've known boards and said, look, we don't need an hour for lunch. We only need half an hour. Well, no, the hour is not to eat. The hour is to mingle and to talk. Um, if you just have a half an hour, you're just rushing around. You go to the do, you do this, you eat, you get, you get back. And after the meeting, as we know, people are are off they've got journeys to journeys to do so it's really important to to make that time whether it's face to face or online and you can do both um next question so this is a bit more challenging one but how can charities ensure that the underrepresented trustees that they appoint are not just tokenistic appointments and that they're actually empowered to bring their unique perspectives and their experiences um, to the board and that those are valued because you're talking at the beginning about different expertise that you might bring and that expertise might not just be about the credentials that you've got or the senior job that you hold so in that context how do we how do we make sure that they're not in um, tokenistic appointments and can I start with you first um, Bola definitely um, I think it it might be like oversimplifying it, but I genuinely think it is just treating everyone as if they like they literally apply for this role. They've got the role that like treating it uh, and giving them that respect in that way. Um, so I think it has to do more with the like mindset of people currently on the boards who are taking in a more like diverse people is like you're not seeing it as we're doing it because we have to, because we just have to like fulfill a quota, but we're doing it because we actually need this diverse thought on our board. And so we actually have to give it that respect because we actively are searching for that. We're making someone go through this whole interview process. And so when they get on it, they deserve that respect. So I, I definitely think it is like pushing the idea of like, you know, token hire or diversity hire is more of like, gaps in your board not that you just are forced to do something it's like there is genuinely a gap in your board that has to be filled because you can contribute something great so let's like let's treat let's actually treat treat it like we we won a trophy here like mm. we actually you know we're benefiting it so we actually need to uphold that so I think, yeah 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 I mean it's it's turning that phrase it's a bit of a hackneyed phrase isn't it that respect is earned and not given well actually i think respect should be given yeah exactly and and conversely you know if somebody proves that they're not worthy of it that's a different matter but respect should be given and and, and respect for the the skills and the experience that you're bringing lucy have you got anything you want to add to to this question uh yeah sorry um yeah i would just say that as well um to not remind the person that's come on the board that they're only there you know oh you're only there because you're young give me your young experience or you're only there you know and actually to not do that in any way shape or form because that's not why that person's there and you know to actually value everything that, that person can bring and to include them in everything that could be they could be included in absolutely uh, one of the things that I've often found is in the past, not so much now, but in the past, it would be if they were talking about a particular demographic, everybody's head would swing to the person who they believe represents that demographic, but their views weren't elicited if it wasn't about their demographic. So they have a pigeonholed them. And after a while, sometimes people conform to that. It's like, oh, you don't want to know about my opinion on anything else. You don't want to know about my opinion on fundraising or the strategy. You just want to know about this small aspect of 
who I am. Um, and that can be that can be quite challenging for individuals to challenge themselves. Any other reflections on that particular question about how do we ensure that people are empowered and they're not just tokenistic appointments? Can I can I comment on sure. that? Uh, it's it's a very good question, and I have struggled with it because, as I said, on the boards where I've on I've all like I've I've be I'm the only person of color. Um, like some some I mean for me I would not see it as tokenistic if they would hire more people of color into the board uh, as as a normal kind of recruitment process but then when I see that they are hiring new people and they are white men or, or women then for me it becomes a very tokenistic kind of a approach uh, i mean on one of the boards um, it, it's a private school and i raised some edi issues and i was kind of sectioned out uh, you know i mean they, they didn't want me to raise those issues um, and i mean i'm i mean i've had i've had allies i mean white male allies um but yeah there, there's been a lot of hue and cry uh, on that board um, i'm st i'm still trying to get that worked and we had a governance review as well and things came out in the governance review and i'm part of the working group as well that's been formed to uh, uh, recommend you implement those recommendations so yes it it does become very challenging and difficult sometimes to kind of um, say whether you know, I mean, yeah, it, it was a normal process because when these things kind of happen, then you are singled out, you know, because you are raising, you know, those issues as a person of color. Absolutely. Uh, so we are, as yeah. we always are, almost at time. I'm going to ask one last question from the um, from the audience. And I'm going to let the first person who, who this question speaks to answer it. So the question is, how have the panel found being on the boards? Have they felt valued? And then they said, I'm not totally sure that my time is that valued sometimes and I've recently left a board for this reason. So does anybody want to speak to that one? Yeah, I'm happy to. So I have had experience um, similar. Um, so I joined the board, I think I was there for maybe a year, year and a half. Um, I wasn't really feeling particularly valued and I stepped down. And the funny thing was when I actually stepped down, I actually got a message or an email from someone saying, oh, we really wanted you to you know, lead on this strategic piece of work. And I just thought, well, why didn't you mention that by the time I was there? Um, but yeah, so I think it's, um, 